Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. Did you hear about the stone outhouses that have been erected near the top of Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado at nearly 13,000 feet? They were designed so inventively that the American Institute of Architects awarded them with a 2019 Small Project Award. Also in the news this past week was the escalating battle over the operation of the Keneal Bay Resort at Virgin Islands National Park in the Caribbean. Will a private equity firm maintain control, or will the resort revert to the National Park's management in 2023, as the late Lawrence S. Rockefeller wanted it to? And for all you RV owners out there, Traveler featured a story on the 10 best tips for National Park RVing. You can find those and other stories on nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, I talk with Kim Titchener, the founder of bearsafety.com, a business that provides bear and wildlife safety training and assessments for staff working in natural habitats. And she has some advice for me and you as well for when we enter bear habitat. Erica Zambello takes us on a tour through the Smithsonian Art Galleries in Washington, D.C. to seek Thomas Moran's famous works featuring early National Park vistas, such as the Wonders of Yellowstone. In fact, his paintings once hung in the Capitol Building, inspiring early lawmakers with views of the West. Finally, what would you think if the National Park Service was pulled out of the Interior Department and set up as a freestanding entity? The agency and the parks very likely could benefit handsomely from such a move. Issues with bears in national parks have been going on since parks were established. Down through the history, there have been problems with black bears and sequoia in Yosemite National Parks, with grizzlies in Yellowstone and Glacier, and with black bears in Shenandoah and Great Smoky Mountains National Parks. Those are just some of the examples that leap to mind. There also have been issues in Canada at Banff and Kootenay National Parks. So what can be done? As communities around national parks grow with year-round residents, And as park visitation also grows during the seasons when bears are most active, what are some of the keys to reducing the threats of interactions between humans and bears? To explore that topic, we're joined today by Kim Titchener, founder of Bear Safety, whose mission is to work with communities and industries on how to live with bears and other wildlife. Welcome, Kim. Hi, Kurt. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Well, we appreciate your making time. Um, bears obviously are a natural element of national parks, and, and yet the human-bear interactions um, don't always go as uh, folks would want them to go. We like to view bears. We don't like to view them up close. Do you have a sense for whether the gist of the problem is too many humans in bear habitat or in bear populations growing in individual bears crossing the line, so to speak, into human habitat? Oh boy, that's a, that's a complicated question to answer. And it, it depends where you are. Uh, in some parts of the United States, we have bear populations that are starting to grow outside of the borders of our national parks and, and moving out into areas like uh, Jackson, where the tolerance level for living with grizzlies is low. And so in some cases, it's, it's a lack of tolerance and a lack, lack of experience living with wildlife. Um, and living with bears. But um, in a lot of the places around North America, what we're seeing as far as large carnivore attacks and conflict rates are, it is the sheer numbers of human beings going into these places. And if if all of those people that were going into those places, into our national parks were educated, then, and we had a different culture around bear safety, then we wouldn't see these conflicts. But it's, it's a combination of too many people and too many people who are just not aware of how to behave in, in, in bear country. You know, that's that's an interesting point you make. And I say that because since 2012, there have been uh, maulings in Denali and Yellowstone, even Valles Caldera National Preserve down in uh, New Mexico. Fortunately, the, la- the last one wasn't a fatal mauling, but nonetheless, it was a, a, a black bear mauling a, a runner, I believe, in a, in a road race. And these stories catch the media. People love to read about death in the national parks. Unfortunately, it's uh, that uh, the gruesome side to human nature, and so these stories get widespread play and widespread attention. And yet, as you mentioned, all these people going to the national parks don't seem to always appreciate the danger that they're going into, despite having read these stories. 
Absolutely. I think uh, human beings, we just naturally say, oh, well, that's not going to happen to me. I mean, your chances of getting killed in a car accident are much higher, but nobody's stopping to say, oh, let's stop driving. We drive more and more all the time because we don't think these things will happen to us. And I think it's also pretty commonplace that that people think that when they go on trails where there's lots of other human beings, then that there's going to be no chance of them having an encounter or, or trail systems that are close to the town sites in our national parks. They're like, oh, it won't happen to me here. And yet, you know, we do have front country incidents uh, as well. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, your, your company, Bear Safety, you work to educate communities and industries on, on how to live with bears and other wildlife. What's your approach? You know, is it they don't just appreciate it or they, they, they do appreciate the dangers and they want, want to learn how to better neutralize them, so to speak? Well, I think what, what we're seeing is that a lot of industries such as forestry, construction, railway, and the oil and gas uh, industry up here in Canada, um, they're starting to see that they're going into these areas where these bears live. They're going into like pretty core habitat in some cases. And staff are working in these areas, sometimes in small groups or alone, and they just don't know what to do when they encounter wildlife. And they also attract them by leaving out garbage, petroleum products. And so they're seeing a lot more interactions. Um, the other piece of that is up here in Canada, um, we, we do forest fire suppression. And so our forests are quite thick and old. And unfortunately, because of that, there's not a lot of great habitat necessarily for bears to feed on food sources. So they're drawn into openings in the forest canopy. So that, you know, that lends to people who are, you know, clear cutting, creating pipeline right of ways, well sites, those are areas where the best foods are. So that's where these interactions are occurring with, with wildlife. And it's not just industry. It's also, um, we see this with the government agencies calling us provincial and federal and, and saying, you know, we're seeing lots of bear activity and, and, you know, a lot of interactions in our national and provincial parks. And um, in those areas, what's going on is, again, the fact that we have international parks, we have, we have prevented forest fires, and we've opened up canopies to create trail systems, to create roadways, to create uh, campgrounds. And the bears have no choice but to go into those areas to feed and and feed on these natural food sources. So there's so many things, Kurt, at play when it comes to human wildlife conflict. And the way that we alter habitat, you know, whether it be in our parks or outside of it, um, has created this situation where bears and other wildlife are drawn into these areas where human beings are. And that's, that's part of the of why we created the uh, the company because bear safety and more, you know, was needed. Is your uh, background in wildlife biology? You know, it's funny. I studied wildlife management and ecology in university, but I have degrees in a several several different interesting fields like environmental education. I did a degree in history and minor in geography, and then I did another degree focused on on parks management and um, in outdoor recreation, parks, and tourism. So. I looked at it more from a human side than I did from um, an ecological side, and I've managed to combine all those skill sets to, to figure out ways to get human beings to change their behaviors um, out in these environments. Do you have a sense for, for whether the, the issue is greater in, in Canada or the U.S. or hard to compare the two countries? You know, it's it's a little bit different depending on the country. That's a, that's a good point. So it depends on what's been studied. So here in Canada and Alaska, you know, Dr. Steve Herrero studied bear attacks by, by black bears. And he looked at black bear attack rates and found that it seems like more people get killed up here by black bears in Canada and Alaska. And, and, and it, it was more, most likely because there's less human beings um, and more bears not really experiencing people as much. So we see more issues with that. And if I look at black bears in the United States and I look at attacks there, there's, there's a study um, recently that's been done on non-fatal black bear attacks. And that, become, that will be coming out this year. And, you know, their research is going gonna, is gonna to show that um, a lot of attacks are related to camping and people leaving food out and people walking their dogs off leash. So it, it depends where you live and what's going on in that environment. So there is a variety of issues depending on the, the location, actually. It's not just, it, it, there's issues in Canada and the United States. It's, it's, both countries are, are definitely seeing a rising number of attacks by large carnivores and rising numbers of conflicts. Um, and more and more bears are getting shot because of it. Yeah, it's interesting, the, the, the black bear situation. It seems that here in the States, um, 
the, the black bears back east in Shenandoah and, and Great Smoky are, are a little bit smaller and, and, and more timid of humans than the, the bears in the, the Sequoia or Yosemite National Park, where the bears might be bigger. And they've, they've figured out that vehicles often might be a food source, and they're growing adept to um, peeling open a, a, a car door or a car window like a pop can. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, wildlife are highly, their behavior is highly impacted by not just the way we alter habitat, but our interactions with them and what we teach them. And um, unfortunately, we're teaching them in a lot of national parks in the United States, and in some cases here in Canada too, that, you know, uh, if you come into a campground, you can get food. If you break open a car, you get food. So um, we've created this situation. It's not the bear's natural behavior to go and just go after people. I know people ask me, oh, well, what if I walk in the forest and I'm carrying a tuna sandwich in my backpack? I'm like, a bear doesn't go, oh, there's a human with a tuna sandwich in a backpack. They go, oh, there's a human. I want to get out of here. That's more of a natural behavior. But if they experience people throwing backpacks with tuna sandwiches in them, then the next time they see a human being, they're going to go, oh, that's where I got the tuna sandwich last time. It's going to be in there again. So we create that. Now, at the same time, national parks, both in the United States and Canada, have been working through the decades to educate both bears and humans. For bears, they work to see that humans should be avoided through hazing or other means. And for humans, they, the, the parks strive to teach the keys and benefits of keeping clean campsites and vehicles. Can you measure the success of these efforts? And is there anything else you'd like to see being done in the national parks of the two countries? Well, absolutely. You know, the park systems in both Canada and United States have created like a lot of educational materials, whether it be brochures and signage, and then, you know, the interpretive programs that we see. And, you know, back in the day, you know, back in, in the ages when they were, they realized this was an issue and they needed to change it. I think they did a really great job, but they also had you know, millions and millions less human beings going to those those places. Now we're way beyond the ability, the capacity to manage the number of human beings going to the parks. That's the that is the root of our problem at this point. You know, we're we're, we're overflowing. Our highways are backed up for for miles and miles because people are trying to get into certain locations like Lake Louise and Banff National Park. And there's just there isn't enough staff, there isn't enough management out there to educate all of those people as they go through the park gates. So we just can't keep up with the volume. That's a good point. That's a very good point. We're talking today with Kim Tishner, the founder of Bear Safety, um, a company whose mission is to work with communities and industries on how to live with bears and other wildlife. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. RV Share provides not only an option for renters to enjoy the perks of RV travel without having to buy one, but an opportunity for owners to earn income by renting theirs out. You'll find everything from large and luxurious Class A RVs all the way to small and easy-to-tow pop-up campers. You can even use their filters to find an RV that is dog-friendly or one that will be delivered right to your campground. Visit RVShare.com to start your search for the perfect RV rental or to list your RV. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Okay, we're back with Kim Tishner, the founder of Bear Safety. Kim, what are some of the key points you drive home in your work with communities and businesses that work in bear habitat? Uh, wow, key points. Uh, starting off is we've got to let wildlife know that we're there. If they don't know we're there, then they have one, no choice but to protect themselves in close range encounters, or two, to perceive us as prey. And 
the reality is, is that, you know, 99% of the time when we go into these places where these animals live, they don't want anything to do with us. They just, their whole life's purpose is to feed and breed and, and survive. And we create a lot of the situations that occur. And so right off the bat, I always tell people when you are going to head into bear country, try to group up, you know, at least a group of four people or more. We definitely don't see attacks when we start to get into large numbers. We're much more intimidating to bears. And we're also not seen as vulnerable when we're in large groups by animals that are considering as prey. So grouping up is great and staying in a tight group. You know, we just, there, were, there was an attack recently in Yellowstone last year and a family had their son attacked by a bear, a grizzly bear. And, you know, the group was probably not close enough to each other to really um, be perceived by the bear as a large group. And so that, that's a big factor. So staying together. The second thing is to make lots of noise. And frequently, if you're moving through areas like rivers and um, creek beds or by waterfalls, that's a lot of noise. And it's also an area when there's water sources that bears are going to be spending time near and bedding down. So we want to be really aware that things like vegetation, high levels of vegetation makes it hard for bears to hear and see us. Wind and water is another big factor. And then of course, when I'm dealing with large industry, it's, it's, you know, being, having really good lines of sight and watching where you walk around buildings and vehicles and things so that you're not coming directly in contact with an animal within a few feet and going, oh my gosh, and and surprising (laughs) them as well, right? And then um, something I I always remind people is bear spray does not stop you from running into a bear, but it definitely works well if you do everything wrong and you still run into an animal or an animal perceives you as food. So carrying bear spray physically on your body so that you can literally just grab it, pull it out and spray it is, is really key. And it's also really important to practice pulling out your bear spray so that it just is instinct. So you see a bear, first thing you do is pull out your bear spray, pull the safety off and start talking with a group of people you're with about what you're going to do, observing the situation and seeing what is the bear doing? What is the behavior of the animal? What is the species of the animal? How are they acting? And now how should I act to get out of the situation? So you can deescalate bear encounters very easily, but unfortunately, a lot of people just don't know what to do when they run into these animals. So that's why we teach at bear safety and more. That's why we teach that, that bear safety behavior so that people understand animal behavior. They understand the difference between defensive behavior and non-defensive behavior so that they can figure out how to get out of the situation instead of making things worse. Yeah. Now some folks um, believe that the, the best uh, deterrent is a, is a handgun. Bear spray, as you mentioned, is a uh a good good source to have out there. Do you have any feeling, I, I've been reading some, um, the use of a air horn, so to speak, to, to scare a bear off. Any, any insights into whether that's uh, helpful or not? For sure. So, uh, I, you know, I recently had a chat with uh, Dr. Tom Smith out of, the, out of Brigham Young University in, in Utah. And, uh, you know, Dr. Tom Smith, as well as Dr. Stephen Harrow, have done quite a bit of research looking at bear attacks And they uh, did some research on uh, Alaskans in particular. They went up to Alaska, looked at cases where people had used bear spray in an encounter with grizzly bears, black bears, and polar bears. And then they did a comparative study and they went and looked at the effectiveness of using a gun. And they looked at all types of guns that, that Alaskans were carrying. And there is a really stark difference in the rates of attack. Um, It seems that people who carry a gun have a tendency to not make as much noise. And um, therefore, obviously, they, they're going to run into bears more easily. It's very difficult to get a gun out, take the safety off, and, and fire to kill in a close-range encounter. I mean, we're talking 16 feet or less is, was mm-hmm. the average distance for people when they encountered, encountered bears. And at that rate, I mean, your, 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 your small motor skills are going to, things are going to break down really quickly. Your heart rate's going to go up, your blood pressure your ability to react to a situation. You know, we're not stress inoculated here. Like my, you know, my, my partner, he's in the military. He can, he can fire a gun off while chewing a sandwich at the same time. He has been, he has been trained for that purpose, but the average person, even though they might be a really get great shot at the range or when they're in a blind, they, you know, they're really great at, at shooting and killing an animal how do you handle an an animal that's, that's 80 feet away from you that can be on your body in under two seconds moving at a high speed? It's just, it's just unrealistic to think that a gun is your best option. I think if you're, you're a hunter, you're a person who carries a a gun in the bush, that's fine. Um, But carry a can of bear spray too, so that you have those options in case things go wrong. We recently here in Canada had an attack in the Yukon 
a few years back where a husband, his wife was being mauled by a grizzly bear and he got out a shotgun and, and thought that he shot and killed the bear and saved his wife. Later, when they did the autopsy on her, she died from gunshot wounds. She wow. did not die from the bear attack. And okay. that's the risk you take with it, with carrying a firearm and using it in a situation like that. Don't you run into somewhat the same problem with bear spray in terms of, you know, you've got a bear charging at you and you've got to keep your wits about you. You've got to pull the bear spray out and get the trigger. Don't you have the same problem there? Well, what's easier about bear spray is it is it is the spray pattern. So when it comes out, it's a fan shape. So it, it goes out wide and it goes out far. So it becomes this big cloud of this orange particulates that kind of floats in the air and you don't have to be good at aiming. You literally just got to pull it out, shoot it. And all of a sudden there's this massive cloud in front of you and it engulfs the animal, which of course causes involuntary eye closure, burning sensation to the skin, coughing, gagging. This animal goes from, I want to eat you or I want to stop you from you know hurting me to, I need to get away from this thing because I've got to survive. And mm-hmm. It's absolutely phenomenal the percentage of people that are are surviving potentially fatal bear attacks because they are using bear spray. Whereas when you pull out a gun, you may hit the bear, you may miss, you may maim the bear and make the situation worse. You may shoot the person you're with by accident. You may not get out your gun at all. And so that's the difference is a bullet compared to one bullet and one shot is all you have compared to a big cloud in front of you. So it, that's why I really push for bear spray and, and, you know, remind my friends who hunt, did you, are you carrying your bear spray today? Cause you, you're walking through that bush quietly looking for animals. You're, you're more susceptible to a close range bear attack because of that. Have you seen any studies on um, whether air horns work at all? Sorry, answer your question about air horns. So I look at air horns similarly to the sound of a gunshot. When you're dealing with a defensive animal, and you you shoot off a, either a gun or something loud like an air horn, it is an aggressive sound. And uh, if you're dealing with a bear that has cubs, you've surprised it at close range or it's defending a food source like a carcass or garbage, and you shoot off an air horn, you increase your chances of, of, of a bear attack and a serious one. So my response to air horns is, yes, carry them. I've got, I've got an air horn in, my, in the top of my pack. And I pull that out and have that handy nearby so I can grab it if I need to. I'm only going to use that in a predatory situation. I'm only going to use that when I have a bear that is intent and interested in me. It has, it's not showing any defensive behavior. It's quiet. It seems to be coming up and interested in me. Just like the attack we just had in Aspen, um, those people decided to back away from the bear, get off the trail. And then the bear came into the bushes after them. It showed interest and intent and it bit the woman. If she had an air horn, that potentially could have been used to scare the bear off. But I would actually choose a can of bear spray over an air horn any day because we know bear spray is an effective tool on bears that are defensive and predatory. And um, an air horn may or may not work. I would use it in an aggressive encounter if I was also using my bear spray trying to scare the animal away. But unfortunately, the air horns don't always work. And it's because we use them as a hazing tool in our parks. And when we have bears that come into places like the town sites or they come into the campgrounds, one of the first things we do is we yell at the bear. We're like, hey, bear, get out of here. And then the next thing we do is we pull out an air horn and we start honking that and that scares them. But over time, as you use these these noise deterrents, eventually the bear starts to ignore them. And if you're dealing with a bear that is highly habituated, that's used to noise deterrents, he or she is already aware of the fact that that's all you've got. That's, you're not going past that noise deterrent and you're not going to kill him. So he's like, well, you didn't do anything but make a hot honk, honking sound at me. So I'm going to come back into the campground and I'm going to keep feeding on those berry bushes. So long-term, those tools can unfortunately, you know, not be useful on bears. Now, there always will be some out there without any tolerance for bears. Does society have a responsibility for working to preserve bears and their habitat? I think they do. I mean, I'm, I'm biased in the sense that I, I love wildlife and I want to see them on, on the landscape. That's my value. I have an intrinsic value for wildlife to be there. Um, environmentally, we need large carnivores on the landscape. They're part of the whole ecosystem. Without them, everything is out of sorts. We, we, we saw that in Yellowstone for years when we didn't have wolves and it changed the vegetation and we had, you know, over browsing by ungulate species. And then when they brought back the wolves, the ecosystem changed and went back and became a healthier system. 
So if we want to have a healthy world, we need carnivores on that landscape. And yes, you are right. There are absolutely people that have zero tolerance. I mean, I was on the phone yesterday with a client that was very upset that they've banned hunting of grizzly bears in, in British Columbia. And he really wishes that he could kill them. And he just doesn't value them. He just, he says, I just don't want them around. I want to be able to do my job and not have bears around. I want to be able to kill them, but now I can't. And luckily they don't, that, that, that those people don't represent the majority. The majority of human beings actually really like to have wildlife on the landscape. And, you know, we can see that because of the numbers of people that go to our national parks and our state parks, and they want to see that wildlife and wild places still exist. So I think there's still a lot of hope out there um, to keep these animals on the landscape. The key is how do we, you know, create connections for these people and how do we get them to understand that they're loving these animals to death versus helping to keep them on the landscape? There are quite a few books out there for folks to read to try to get an understanding of bear attacks and bear behavior. Stephen Herrero's book, Bear Attacks, Their Causes and Avoidance, long has been my go-to book. But you also have The Essential Grizzly, The Mingled Fates of Men and Bears by Doug and Andrea Peacock, and Mark of the Grizzly by Scott McMillan. Are there any resources you'd recommend for folks heading into bear country to read before they head out? Sure. Well, as much as I love Stephen Herrera's book, Bear Attacks, I would read it in the winter. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's just too scary to read all those attacks because then you start to think, oh my God, this is going to happen to me. But, you know, you know, 99% of the time when people walk into a park, they're going to be fine. Um, So uh, my recommendation is to look at the bear education safety information on the website of the government agency that you're, you're, you know, the park that you're going to. So our national um, parks do have information on bear and wildlife safety. The last organization that I ran before Bear Safety and More was WildSmart and um, wildsmart.ca. We have a great website full of information on bear safety, cougar safety, elk safety, coyote safety. Uh, So there's some great stuff on there. And, uh, you know, I take a course where it's possible. I mean, I'm, you know, we're certainly offering bear safety courses, but trying to find one locally can be a little bit harder. So I'd, I'd, I'd contact your local state or national parks and see if there's going to be any talks coming up that you can, that you can join and, and, and go to. And last but certainly not least, uh, there is actually a video you can watch called Staying Safe in Bear Country. And it was made a number of years ago by Stephen Herrero and a group of, of great bear biologists that decided, let's make a video and show people what to do and how to behave in bear country. So. I think that's a a great one. And you can actually download that online. Um, So it's called Staying Safe in Bear Country. Yeah, I think a lot of people, um, when they head out to a national park, they they think bears first and foremost, and they forget about the the other wildlife. I mean, there's always bison gorings going on at Yellowstone. Um, There was an incident just the other day, I believe, in in Yellowstone where somebody was kicked by a a cow elk. And so we have to uh, appreciate that uh, we're entering their home territory, so to speak, and uh, they can be touchy just as humans can be touchy. For sure. I've been driving around Canmore for the past day and and having to pull over several times as I see tourists walking up to the the pregnant or recently calved elk here as they come into town site trying to avoid the carnivores. And it's easy to forget about the other species because bears are such a predominant image that we think of when we think of national parks. Uh, But yes, yeah, I mean, year round, we have to be thinking about this. And, you know, we also, a lot of places have cougars. And, you know, this is why it's so important that we, when we have small children, that we keep them close by. If we have our dogs with us, we keep them on a leash. And a lot of the principles of bear safety lend quite well over to some of the other carnivore safety. So, you know, it's, again, making lots of noise, traveling in groups, keep your children close, keep your dogs on a leash, keep their, you know, um, away from wildlife. And, and that lends well to all of those species. But people just sometimes just don't understand. It's not all about the selfie. It's not all about the picture with the with these animals. Like they deserve and they have the right to having space. They have such few places in this world to live and thrive. Uh, and our national parks, it's supposed to be one of them. And we've turned them into amusement parks for our own Instagram accounts so that we can be like, hey, look at me with a bear. Hey, look at me with an elk. And we forget that this isn't a zoo, and we keep treating it that way. We've been talking today with Kim Titchener, the founder of Bear Safety, a company based in uh, Alberta, Canada, whose mission is to work with communities and industries on how to live with bears and, and other wildlife. 
Kim, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm sure we could go on much longer, but uh, we all have uh, limits to what we can do. So perhaps down the road, we can come back and revisit this with you. For sure. That would be great. Thanks so much. And uh, hope you're getting out for some good hikes in the next little while. Um, It's on my schedule as soon as it stops raining. (laughs) Yes. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It is an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. In the 1870s, Thomas Moran packed up his art supplies and joined F.V. Hayden's Geological Survey of Yellowstone. In 1872, he followed up his expedition with another to Yosemite, and then, in 1873, visited the Grand Canyon. Originally from England, he moved to Philadelphia as a child, and through his expeditions west, introduced the American people to future national parks before such a system even existed. Nearly 150 years later, I was on my own expedition to find his paintings of the national parks in the famous Smithsonian Art Museums. I lived in Washington, D.C. for a year after I graduated from college, so I was fairly familiar with the Smithsonian National Gallery of Art and nearby American Art Museum, though I only remember visiting the former a few times and never the latter. If I had been more organized, On a recent return trip to D.C., I could have done a bit of research and zeroed in on the Moran works as soon as I arrived in the National Monument shadow. But that's not really how I do things, so my parents and I took winding tours around these hallowed halls of landscape paintings, waiting to see images of the West catch my eye. We began in the National Gallery of Art, first walking from the East to the West Building, before asking a docent and realizing the two paintings were in fact, in the East Building. Room after room held gorgeous landscapes, depicting scenes not only in the United States, but across the world. The first painting I found of Thomas Moran depicted a group of Native Americans on horseback, the stone cliffs of Wyoming catching sun in the background. In the painting, Green River Cliffs, Moran depicts the people fading into the distance as the blue, cloud-smattered sky takes over at least half the canvas. A few rooms over, I find the Huniata Evening from another trip Thomas Moran took to Pennsylvania. Here, again, the only person in the frame is small, an artist trying to depict the gorgeous river and valley below, perhaps as a self-portrait. While both paintings were beautiful, they didn't depict the trips to the future national parks for which Thomas Moran would eventually be known for. They were also normal-sized, smaller than my outstretched arms. During another Google search, I realized Moran's National Park works were actually in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Oops. No worries. I was an intrepid art explorer, and the next day my parents and I returned to the American Art Museum and beelined to the second floor, where a section of the map read Moran Wing. In no hurry, I took my time again through the landscapes then made my way through the portrait galleries and even the room devoted to modern art before I turned a corner and froze in my tracks. I had found them. 
The three Moran paintings were enormous, stretching across the entire length of the wall. The first, entitled The Chasm of Colorado, depicts the Grand Canyon, overlapping red rocks and crevices giving away to a half rainbow in the hazy sky. Low clouds cluster against the canyon walls, making the landscape appear as if in motion. This painting was eventually purchased by Congress and hung in the U.S. Capitol building. Moving to my right, I surveyed the second huge painting, the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. The falls are far in the distance, with the red of the valley contrasted with patches of bright green trees. Originally painted for the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893, the work coincided with the general feeling among Americans that the western frontier was no more, and settlement would follow the earlier stages of exploration. Now, people began to see national parks as a refuge from development, places that must be protected before they disappeared altogether under relentless pressure from moving and increasing populations. In the information card to the side of the painting, the museum explains, quote, In this work, Moran seems to have sought a different meaning. The diffuse brushwork and softer atmosphere, captured in the misty veil above the falls, no longer suggests the theme of scientific discovery, but instead evoke the past, unquote. I turn last but not least to another view of the falls, painted years earlier. Entitled The Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, this work was also purchased by Congress to hang in the Capitol. The foreground is covered in shadows, making the falls one of the brightest points on the canvas. Two people stand on a rock overlooking the magnificent view, so tiny compared to everything around them. I like this most about Moran's work, the inclusion of us humans, but reminding us how truly we compare to the wonders of the natural world in which we inhabit. Thomas Moran contributed sketches and paintings of Yellowstone that were included in the expedition report by Ferdinand Hayden of the USGS. It is this report that convinced Congress that the area should be protected, and Yellowstone became the very first national park. With his large landscapes of the West, including future additional park sites, he provided the breathtaking vistas that other Americans imagined when they pictured the West. I'm biased, of course, but to me, the trio of works were the most impressive in the American Art Museum well worth the time it took to find them. The Yosemite Conservancy inspires people to support projects and programs that preserve Yosemite National Park and enrich the visitor experience. The Conservancy funds transformative work throughout the park. The grant's donors support help protect diverse wildlife and plant species and restore the precious habitats they depend on. Grants also support improvements to miles of trails to ensure visitors can safely access Yosemite's wonders. Visit yosemiteconservancy.org to find more inspiration. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles from Key West, just very well might be the most remote national park in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing on pristine beaches. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. Here's an idea that perhaps is not as radical as it sounds. Take the National Park Service out of the Interior Department and make it a standalone agency, somewhat similar to the Smithsonian Institution. Congress created the Smithsonian back in 1846 as a public-private partnership with a board of regents overseeing the administration of the Smithsonian. As such, partisan politics are a step or two removed from the Smithsonian. The same can't be said for the National Park Service these days. But if you remove the Park Service from Interior, you separate the agency from the politically appointed Interior Secretary and his or her staff. You also avoid situations such as the current one at the National Park Service, where there is no Senate-confirmed director of the agency. Instead, P. Daniel Smith, who was a political appointee to the Park Service during the administration of George W. Bush, has been acting as director with the curious title of 
deputy director, exercising the authority of the director. Former Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke brought Smith out of retirement back in January 2018. He came back to the Park Service with a significant blot on his resume. The Inspector General of the Interior Department had found that Smith in 2004 ignored Park Service regulations and pushed through a permit to allow the owner of the Washington Redskins to cut down trees in a scenic easement along the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal National Historical Park. Take the Park Service out of Interior and set it up as a freestanding entity and you significantly reduce, if not entirely eliminate, the odds that a director of the agency will drift with the political currents instead of looking out for what's best for the national park system. Give it a board of regents, much like the one guiding the Smithsonian, and you lessen the odds even more. That board, for example, is comprised by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Vice President of the United States, three members of the United States Senate, three members of the House of Representatives, and nine citizens. To complete the administrative reorganization, place the National Park Foundation into this freestanding National Park Service entity. What are the benefits? Immediately, you remove the political interference from whichever party is controlling the presidency. You have a permanent director with a term decided by the Board of Regents who could act in the best interests of the Park Service, not the desires of the president. You have scientists allowed to do their work without being silenced or pressured to slant the results. Had such an organization been in place the past decade or so, it's possible that the untenable situation at Virgin Islands National Park, where a private equity firm is trying to dictate its stay operating the Keneal Bay Resort, would have been resolved years ago. Superintendents who want to protect their park's resources as best they can might not have their plans dismissed due to political pressures. The director of the Park Service could outline the agency's budgetary needs clearly with congressional appropriators without having to tow the administration's preferences. Such reorganization won't be accomplished overnight, and once in place, it won't be perfect. But it could reward the United States with a better run and much more strongly mission-oriented National Park Service, one unafraid of political consequences. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Let us know what you thought by sending comments to news at nationalparkstraveler.org. We're also always on the lookout for interesting topics to present on our podcasts. You can send your suggestions to news at nationalparkstraveler.org as well. For National Parks Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Travelers coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.